Um, all right. Um, so um, for the breakout session today, uh, one of the goals is to see, um, in addition to, you know, sort of uh, strategy and themes, if we can actually spend today getting super tactical um, and share some, you know, things that we've all been doing um, over the last couple of weeks or, or things that we're planning to do over the next couple of weeks um, to help all of us. Um, when we get back with the full group, um, we're going to want to um, share our sort of best takeaways. So as we're going through the discussion, you can think about um, some of the, the biggest takeaways that you might be implementing and, and share those when we get back with the group. So the primary topic we'll jump in um, for today is really talking about um, how we're thinking about um, leading indicators for churn. Um, and how we're thinking about health scores or flagging at-risk customers, given what we're dealing with today. Um, and related to that, I'm sure we all had various uh, health scores or at-risk playbooks prior to the situation, but um, the coronavirus could actually be forcing us to rethink that and maybe pivot and use some different tactics now and uh, as we get out of this going forward. So wanting to talk about things like that, whether you guys have success planning or exec sponsorship programs, um, you know, or anything related to what you're doing. So to kick us off, um, I actually personally have um, implemented uh, sort of an interim engagement score uh, for my customers uh, at Platters because of the coronavirus. So I thought I'd kick off the discussion and share tactically what I've been doing, and then I'd love to hear from all of you about what you've been doing as it relates to this topic. Um, so for, for my contacts, for my company, we provide food programs um, uh, in office. So obviously with all of the offices being closed, um, you know, our revenue pretty much went to zero. Um, so it's been a pretty massive impact to the business. We've been creative with offering some work from home solutions, but really the big question that I'm asking myself right now is as people begin to plan to reopen offices, um, what is the current status of each of my customers and especially each of my key accounts? Um, and so what we're doing now is we're engaging customers. We've created four criteria that we've added to Salesforce so that we can report on this and CSMs can be inputting this information as they get it. And so we're actually um, recording what was the business impact um, to our customers' business as it relates to the coronavirus. So, you know, were they negatively impacted? Um, you know, is their business actually uh, seeing an increase in demand because they have a service that's really helping people right now? So we're kind of capturing the current state of our customers' business. Um, the second thing is we've all experienced and we all know there's been a lot of layoffs. And so we're noticing a theme that a lot of our primary champions, our point of contacts are gone. So we're using this as an opportunity to assess is our main champion and point of contact there or not? Um, additionally, for our context specifically, we want to know if they're already planning to cut their food program, to cut costs, even when things go back to normal. So we're trying to assess if they've made a decision um, or if they're still evaluating that. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, we're, uh, we're un trying to understand as best as possible if they have any plans for reopening their offices. Um, we're sort of just at the beginning phases where people are starting to talk about this, so just trying to capture that. So I have four fields in Salesforce um, that is uh, capturing sort of the high level conclusion and then some notes fields to capture some of the uh, nuance, of course, that always exists. Um, and we're using that as a way to, number one, um, for me to be able to report up to my CEO and, and say, you know, these, these customers, this prior revenue uh, is at risk, this is safe, um, this is unknown. And then additionally, um, my next step from here is gonna be putting together a playbook for how we can uh, basically act on this information with the team and provide a tailored plan for each of our customers. Um, so I'll pause there, but just to kick off the discussion very tactically, that's, that's what we've been doing. Um, who would like to share next about some of the things that they're thinking about as it relates to this topic? Um, I'll say, I'll, I'll talk if it's possible. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Moshe Lifshitz. I'm a VP of customer success and wish at wish trip. Uh, the headquarters of the company are in, are in Israel. So by us, it's already evening and, um, 
basically what we do, we give a solution for our, for parks and cities, regional councils regarding uh, managing tourism. So basically, like as you said before, kind of <laughs> the whole uh, industry is shut down. Um, so all of our indicators for the way they use our platform, also the end users and also the businesses, because we are basically a, a B2B to C program is basically very, is very low, even though happily to say that we could see already in the far East, let's say Taiwan, Singapore, um, and such uh, slowly, slowly more and more uh, people using the platform. So that's uh, it's a good sign. Um, so in general, uh, what we offer the, our, our customers, because <laughs> it's very, very difficult to understand um, for us to see, to create this for now new indicators because the usage of the, of the program is very, very low or almost close to zero. So basically we're planning for them um, for the day after. They were, everyone is talking about the, how is it going to be to live besides the corona because people don't think it's going to actually disappear in a day. Um, and our platform basically will give, we're creating a whole way for them to use the program as a way to uh, maintain their visitors in the park. So we're very, very proactive and we're offering them um, initiative way of using our system to be very, very relevant for them the second they open the parks. Um, at least in Israel, uh, hope God it's going to already going to start to happen in two weeks. Um, by us already, offices are or thirty percent of offices are are open. So slowly, slowly, uh, we're going back to business. Um, so I, I I could say in a nutshell that we're we're trying to be in a very un um, very fragile unknown uh, uh, era to be very very clear and initiative of what we're offering with our system to be and to try to. Um, create something that we are like at the top and we're going to actually lead them out, help them leading and lead them out. Um, with that said, uh, making the, uh, making us be a, someone that, that they could look up to and help them actually in the day they open uh, to be there. And, and I, and as, as, and as for us for indicators is the way they uh, relate to what we send them. We could see how much they would, would use us in the future. If, if it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Are there any specific uh, like uh, criteria um, that you're evaluating for your business and are you using your CRM to capture this in, in any way um, that, that you'd like to share? Uh, basically, we, we created a system um, inside our, our software is how much they use it and stuff like that. So Usage the second data. We see, yeah, the, we, the second we see more and more usage and clicks and such, we can know, we can understand uh, the the way the customers uh, work. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing, um, and best of luck. I hope that things Actually, continue to move in a positive direction, and you're able to to recapture a lot of your customer relationships and your revenue. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And Thanks again, for sharing. Uh, oh. Who's next? Sorry, sorry. Hi, Megan. I just wanted to jump in. Anika here. I'm director of customer success at Zap. Uh, we're a business intelligence platform. I'm in London, but my team is located all over the world. And since this started, we've kind of just revamped our entire customer structure and how we actually segment our customer base. We realized that um, our our key customers were no longer our key customers. It didn't matter how much ARR they were paying us. We to kind of created three different buckets. We call them now thriving, surviving, and risk customers. So, um, and we base that breakdown now by um, the industry the customer's in, the annual revenue of that actual business. So not how much money they're paying us, but their annual revenue, um, mm -hmm. their number of users with our platform, their daily number of logins, and then finally their ARR that they, they do pay us. So we take all those criteria and then we then um, bucket them into either a thriving company, so somebody that is uh, thriving due to coronavirus, so someone maybe in the communications tools or someone that's, um, you know, really seeing the benefit of corona because of us all working from home, they're needing to up their production of, of their product or their service. And then we then go into surviving, which again, those are the customers that we see that are going to make it through to the other side of, of coronavirus. They might not be purchasing more licenses with us. They might not be, um, you know, 
recommending our product right now because they are just surviving through this. And then we have our at risk. And those are the ones that we are definitely either seeing as potential churn or have already churned due to furlough or because of the, the just the industry they're in and, and what's happening with them. So because of those three buckets, we created three new playbooks um, to approach those. So um, if it's a thriving customer, we have a particular QBR or uh, executive business review that we do with that client. If they're surviving, we then do something separate with them. And if they're at risk, we either have already placed them into a um, financial model showing that, you know, their potential loss right now. So our, our CFO and our CEO understand that this is the this is our churn attrition due to coronavirus and what we're going to expect. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what we've started to do in the last month. We just resegmented our customer base so that we can really start to see which customers are, are for us to focus on, which ones we can actually see revenue from because of coronavirus and which ones we, we shouldn't be focused on as much. So I thought I'd, I'd share that with the group. Yeah, that's uh, fantastic. I love that you're even considering the company's ARR themselves. That's really smart to do. What are some of the key differences of how you're tackling like the surviving segment versus the thriving segment? If, if you can go into a little more detail, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, sure. With, um, for example, like with a thriving business versus surviving, any new feature launch or anything that's changing in our product, a lot of our surviving isn't going to want to hear about that in a in an EBR. They're gonna they're gonna just want to know how they can pay their bill or what's gonna get them over the hump. So with thriving, we tend to show newer features that we want to upsell or maybe um, add on to their licenses because of a certain feature that we're using, whether it be a new dashboard that we've released or a certain data connector that might be significant to their industry. We we share that kind of information versus with surviving, we definitely just try to make sure we're maintaining status quo with that customer. We want to make sure that they are continuing to see the same number of logins per day and that their, their the daily usage is still the same. And if they're not, we then go into kind of the, they kind of go into the risk category. So we kind of go into more of like a, a reactive approach with them rather than, than trying to upsell them. But the, the, I guess the key differences with the thriving is that we try to definitely um, not push a sale, but definitely work on introducing new features, new parts of our product, the way that we would normally do a QBR before coronavirus, but with surviving, we're not necessarily approaching those customers with the same um, gusto as, as, as usual, because we, because they usually might not have the time, really, they're just trying to make sure their business comes out the other end, our product might not be the number one concern for their business right now. So we're not usually doing the same level of, of executive review with them. That makes total sense. Um, and Anika, Zoe actually asked you a question in our chat that I thought was good. Do you find that managing your customers based on their health status takes away from your team's ability to be proactive with their engagement? Uh, yes and no. I think the new way that we're starting to score our customers based on, like I said, if their current industry or their current business is in the thriving bucket, um, it kind of reassesses where the team's time has to go. Um, I don't want to team, for example, we have um, uh, Regal Entertainment Group as one of our customers. And right now they're probably likely to file bankruptcy and they're in our risk category. So um, one of my senior CSMs in the US is not likely to uh, well, we've we've done everything we can, but now it's been escalated to our finance and collections team to talk about what we're going to do because they're likely going to be a lost customer. So now that's freeing up time for my senior CSM to possibly move on to another client that's maybe adding on 10 more, 10 more logins or 10 more users um, that they can focus on. So I think that having a health score that's more designed right now, obviously this might be different when we're not like post corona but um during coronavirus i think that it's it's important for us to see who's really uh the health score that we should focus on and, and the customer we should focus on yeah absolutely that's that's great uh brian i see that you've added some uh comments as well um regarding the framework that you're using um would love to pass it over to you it sounds like you have some super tactical advice you can share um including a screen share potentially can I kick it over to you to, to share with the group? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Megan. So Brian LaFile, uh, I work in the Looker division within Google Cloud. Um, so we actually found that uh, risk, you know, it's good to understand like risky customers and we were good at capturing kind of customers that are at risk. What we found from the field and feedback that we had was that it, it was not granular enough to take action. Um, so let me share my screen here. We actually came up with a, a framework that I think helped codify our actions a little bit better 
Um, can you all see this? Yes. So th again, this is no nothing like earth shatteringly new. Um, customer value over time, right? We'd expect it to go up in the onboarding, adoption, renewal, et cetera. Uh, what we found though, after doing a bunch of research with our customers, both quantitatively and actual exit interviews, um, where we actually got a third party consultant to come in and, and interview our churned customers, uh, we found that, that risk was cropping up in both acute and chronic fashions. Uh, acute being something that happens with coronavirus is a good example. Uh, I think there was a travel company that was uh, just mentioned where basically that industry just kind of shriveled up overnight. That's an acute risk. Happens overnight, nothing we can do about it. Uh, but we needed ways to kind of capture that, that type of risk. Um, a chronic risk is something that is a bug in the product. A bug is not necessarily going to lead to a customer churning, just one individual bug. Uh, but the accumulation of bugs over time certainly leads to additional risk. Uh, so we came up with this framework and we mapped out these various nine different types of risk. Um, this was meant to help, again, codify the types of risk that we see in our customer base. And then for each one of these kind of journeys uh, that we did in terms of a life cycle mapping of risk, we were able to identify, is it chronic, is it acute, and how do we take action, right? So these are the nine different categories. Uh, the one I think that, that is most prevalent and interesting right now is just this macro category, macroeconomic. Um, that encompasses things like there was an acquisition, bankruptcy layoffs, uh, company turmoil, and COVID-19 actually is, has driven up macro risk to be uh, a key focus and area emphasis for, for the business. Um, and again, we're, we're a data company, so we wanna make sure that we're taking a quantitative approach uh, however we can. And so we have suggested leading metrics of how do we address that prior to the, the customer becoming a full-on churn risk. Um, so again, that, that's something that, you know, I don't know if others have done something like this, but it certainly helped us in kind of codify our thinking of why our customers leave, why they're having a poor experience with our product. And then by having actually leading metrics, we've been able to um, identify these customers earlier on uh, and track uh, each of these customers in these various risk categories. Um, so again, that's just how we're approaching things. I don't know if people have done things similarly, but it really helped with us because we were able to say, not just customers what we're, we're at risk, but at risk and why. Um, and if we know that there is some sort of sentiment risk, again, there's different playbooks for each one of these that we're, we're, we've rolled out to the field. This is awesome, Brian. Um, so do you have this framework fully integrated into like Salesforce or something so that, that CSMs are um, able to like select from a drop down menu or like how is it integrated into that system? And then would also love to hear a little bit more. Um, I don't know if you can give an example of a playbook for maybe one of the risk types. Yeah, so um, the risk types do live in Salesforce, but we try to use data as much as possible to drive. Um, you know, I think that we started in a qualitative with uh, uh, assessment. So the CSM assessed, hey, is this customer at risk and why? Um, any manual input of data, as I'm sure all of you guys are all very uh, uh, tuned into, um, leads to data integrity issues, right? You've got accounts that may be missed. Uh, you're leaving it up to humans to, to make that decision. So we've slowly but surely, as we've built out the integrity of the data on our, uh, our metrics ourselves, we've moved away from having CSMs flagged manually, and now data sets the risk, type, risk types for us. Got so it. you're kind of flip-flopping the motion. Before it was a qualitative with quantitative measures to back up, and now it's quantitative led with a CSM validated. Um, and that, that's helped a lot because we actually take a lot of the bias out of risk. Um, and so that, that has been monumental to us. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of people run into is, and, and what we certainly are not immune to, is relationship risk. It's when the champion leaves or the person gets promoted and they leave the company, they win the lottery, whatever happens. Uh, but you know, those scenarios, like a very tactical example is having playbooks set up for that particular risk, understanding that an email might have bounced, flags the risk to the CSM, the CSM has access to LinkedIn Premium. We're now reaching out to other people in the business to actually understand basically immediately who we can work with on the on the rollout and the deployment. Got it. So I feel like just one be, example. Yeah, that's awesome. I feel like that could be a whole other topic. It's like how to multi-thread effectively and get to multiple people within the organization. Uh, easier said oh, than yes. done. <laughs> Um, awesome. That was fantastic. Does anyone else have any questions for Brian? I know he covered a lot of uh, really great. I was taking a few notes too. That was some helpful stuff for, for sharing. Um, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> go, ahead. go ahead. 
I, oh, you first. Okay. Perfect. I, I, th thanks. Um, so my, my question is about the, the, the risk uh, framework you showed, Brian. How, how much of that is, is new versus that you already had in place? And how much has changed in the last weeks uh, in, in that? Yeah, so we started working on the framework about a month. Uh, well, we started doing research about 12 months ago. It was just, a, just over a year ago, we started doing exit interviews. Uh, what we found is that uh, when we were doing exit interviews ourselves, our customers were not being truthful with us. Uh, as you can imagine, <laughs> if a customer is ready to leave your, yeah. your product or solution, they're not very willing to jump on the phone and talk about why. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by engaging a third party, yeah, by engaging a third party, this person was talking to them as an unbiased person that's like, hey, I'm not even associated with the company. I just want to know more about your experience. And that led to much, much higher response rates. So we started doing that probably about uh, Q2 of last year. Um, with that, we formulated kind of the, the various risk types, which was probably Q4 of last year. And it was, it was perfect timing because again, like we had this set up, we instituted it at our um, big kind of like customer launch event, which we do with all of our CSMs in Q1. Uh, it was fully rolled out. And then when COVID hit, as you can imagine, the macro risk category shot through the roof. So, you know, previously, it, the macro risk type was kind of flying under the radar. There were other things that were bigger uh, impacts to the business. And so we were deprioritizing macro risk um, in terms of building out playbooks. However, once macro risk uh, became the number one category of, of impact to the business, within the span of a week, we had a playbook rolled out. So okay. that was a bit, the ability to see data, respond quickly, and get it in the hands of CSMs within the span of about a week. Um, wow. And so that was, it was good to have the data drive us. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how it's changed. Awesome. Cool. Um, this is Andreas. Um, I'm, I'm a consultant and I work with um, multiple companies on their CS programs. And um, I, I found this uh, very encouraging to uh, to see this kind of customer journey baseline benchmarking, I, I use a similar approach. And, um, oops, sorry. My camera's gone. I apologize. Something interrupted here. And um, basically put uh, customers into categories who is kind of your cruiser that is just puttering along like everyone else in this journey who are the champions and um, what, what are they doing and what are we doing differently? So both an external and an internal view of their uh, successes and then who is at risk. And so uh, similarly, um, of course, now many uh, customers are falling kind of down the, uh, the cliff, but to find the specific playbooks for those events. So um, it's uh, good to see other people have kind of the, the same idea around this. Thanks for sharing. Absolutely. Thanks, Andreas. Who else would like to share some of the things that they're thinking about? Kevin? I'd love to share. Uh, so uh, when it comes to us over at Ring Central uh, right now, I'm a customer success manager there. Uh, we have actually don't have that many data points that we're uh, working with. Uh, so a lot of our uh, initiatives are uh, CSM are recognized was that um, especially in this day, in this uh, COVID-19 era now is the time for us to be really driving across a unified a unified communications platform to be able to talk through uh, different uh, different areas there um, so right now what Uh, we can't hear you, Kevin. Had to happen at some point to someone. <laughs> I know. Um, I'm hoping it comes back. I can jump in in the meantime if needed. Oh, he's back. Uh, Kevin, I think okay. are you back? Will you yes, sorry it about out? That. It's okay. Just um, uh, yeah, so keep what, going. What we've done uh, is a couple of things. The first is that um, we've uh, reached out to our customers to let let them know that. Uh, we're here for them at, um, and we'll also be able to uh, discuss any kind of financial nature of, of the business. So we are recording actively 
um, any of those conversations that um, that are occurring and uh, what are the financial uh, impacts that uh, our customers are experiencing. The second is that we're using this as an opportunity to really uh, try to learn more about their work from home situation. Uh, because we're a communication software, we're trying to um, integrate a lot of the different aspects of our software into their day-to-day -day life because we realize that this is a now or never uh, type situation where the value is immediate and they, they should be experiencing it uh, right away. And uh, because of the, a little bit of the unknown of, uh, of people working from home for the first time, this is our, our best opportunity to be able to drive adoption. Uh, so we've been um, having conversations about the, uh, the tech stacks that customers are using, uh, but uh, customers are not uh, well aware that we're actually using it also to find out what they're using in lieu of our own services because uh, we haven't had as much penetration on our, uh, our Glip app, which is similar to like Slack. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're using this as an opportunity to uh, really drive the adoption on, uh, on Glip, um, in including uh, running some forced adoption plays where now I'm communicating personally with my customers uh, via, via Glip, uh, so letting them know that that's the easiest way to uh, get in contact with me uh, versus a phone call or uh, versus an email. Uh, so monitoring uh, just how much they're uh, now starting to uh, communicate using uh, Glip um, is a, is another uh, leading leading indicator of how we're uh, how we're managing the customer for uh, for the time being and also for the future. Awesome! Thank you so much for sharing, Kevin. <coughs> Thank you, um, Gabriel. Were you about to jump in? Was that you or someone else? It was Ziv, right? Oh, it was Ziv. Me. Yeah, yeah. Ziv, go ahead. Take um, Hey, Ziv Israel, uh, I'm more optimistic. I hope I'll be able to surf next week, but who knows? Uh, our customers are e-commerce uh, and marketplaces. So they were affected by the Corona and the COVID-19. What we did here and what I've done with the team is basically having some evaluation criteria, uh, starting from uh, business, understanding the country and the region, because some of them are being uh, are entering and uh, coming in and out from quarantine and how that uh, impact them. Uh, the online channel, what portion of the business it is. Some of them are more uh, brick and mortars. Some are uh, fully online. Uh, understanding the uh, the channel, the online channel uh, status, meaning business as usual. Are they able to, uh, to complete the transaction? Are they not able to complete the transaction? Does the uh, website is down? How they enter? the crisis, meaning some of them were uh, playing with relatively low margins and uh, had a higher risk. Some are with higher uh, margins and, and stronger brands. So they, they came into that uh, much stronger. Um, second criteria was about contractual. Is that a POV or full contract? How long is it uh, until we're gonna renew the product? Do they have uh, an exit close? Um, what type of uh, payment terms they have, um, the value, how much value we provide to them. Do we have a clear ROI that we can demonstrate to the executives, what type of relationship we have. So, and here I'm focusing mainly on the executives and less about the, uh, uh, the champion and uh, across the team. I'm, I'm really uh, focusing on the, uh, on the executive. Uh, and as part of the relationship, we do have ACV because at the end of the day, we need to choose our battles and we need to choose um, where we uh, need to spend our efforts. Based on that score, basically, we divided those to three groups, uh, surviving, risk, and negotiations, uh, because we do know that some customers leverage the, uh, the situation to renegotiate. Uh, so we put them in three different uh, buckets. And then according to that, the CSM have a um, few tools that they can play with and they can, uh, uh, they can use. So it's one is financial, second is uh, business value, and third is technical. Uh, so it could be uh, change the business model from fixed fee to, let's say, let's move to uh, performance base. And we had a customer that we actually 
decided that we're shifting to uh, performance based because their challenge was we're not we're not able to commit to a, a fixed fee we are not able to uh, uh, because we don't know what's going to happen etc and they were about to renew in a month and we said you know what let's let's make sure that uh, we're we're taking the same risk here uh, and we agreed on a revenue share uh, model and we moved into that um, other tools are uh, split payments, deferred payment, uh, et cetera. Uh, we, in rare cases, we go into freezing the, uh, the contract, but we're trying not to extend it so we'll not have to play with the, uh, with the ACV. Uh, business value is more towards uh, adding more capabilities, uh, avoiding uh, overages on allotment, uh, providing them marketing resource on our end so they don't need to do that. Uh, technical is basically taking solution reviews and say, hey, we'll not just do that for you, we'll also support you with R&D resource that can uh, help you with that. Uh, everything regarding marketing and, and communication, this is something I've decided that I'm putting aside because the market changed so rapidly and we're relatively a small team. So um, that I haven't been formalizing and, and this is something that we measure uh, uh, as a case by case. And then all the tools that we, um, we gave the CSMs, I basically uh, split them to the uh, different buckets and then they, they can know what they can do for each bucket and the level of approval that they need to get. So for changing the business model, this is something that we obviously will not provide to negotiation, we'll provide that to the surviving uh, uh, account, uh, et cetera. So that was the model and that's metrics that we've created. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. We have about five minutes before we will be sucked back into the, the bigger Zoom room. Um, so is there one other person that wants to share uh, in, in the remaining time that we have? It'd be great. Oh, yes. Hi, Megan. Hi, everyone. I'm Melinda, currently part of Team Furlough. So my reference is to the most recent um, experience I had. Um, so immediately, uh, because our product is a nice to have for the development teams, um, when, the, when COVID hit, all professional services ceased to have any engagements, right? So we were figuring out how can we leverage those professional services resources, regardless of our, if our customers are surviving or thriving, um, is there a project that got put on hold because of the pandemic um, where they could give that to us, our professional services could write the code or complete the automation for them and then hand it back to them, no charge, uh, just to keep them going, help them survive this time. So briefly, that was one way. That's great. Thank you for sharing, Melinda. Really appreciate it. Uh, we'll have time for one more actually. Who else would like to, to, to wrap up the session and uh, share a bit about how you're thinking about health scores, leading indicators for churn? Come on, I know there's one more of you that wants to share. <laughs> John Ekbari, I see you're on the call. You're my one of my LinkedIn friends. How you been doing? <laughs> Good, good. Good to see you, Megan. <laughs> I recognize your name, so I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> you are. <laughs> well, I work, I, I, um, I kind of help with sales and biz dev for startups. And one of the things we're seeing, and actually um, Adam, who I don't know, had, had a similar comment, which is to go, we're, we're kind of starting from relationships because people, number one, the people we have the most communications with before the, the virus are the ones we feel are going to be most more likely to speak to us about how, how they view things, what their priorities are, and mm -hmm. kind of work from there. So we're trying to both be questioning and asking. And as we listen, if we hear patterns and, and things, um, not only listen and, and, and in, in, ingest that, but then turn around and actually use it in our outbound conversations. Say, hey, we're hearing customers similar to you are experiencing this or are thinking about that. So it not that we know the answers, but it becomes a way to seed other com uh, conversations. Yeah, that's uh, I, I can't tell you we've boiled it down to a playbook, honestly, that where I can kind of you know predict what, what questions to ask and the sequence and all. But we're finding that it, it does help rather than 
hey, how's it going? You know, isn't it rough in the virus, you know, in the COVID, hope you're surviving. Hey, do you want to talk? I mean, so it's a way to see conversations with a little more focus. And, and what we're finding is if people say, well, no, I don't have that challenge, but I have this other one. So sometimes it does become kind of this um, deflection, but it kind of, I feel it earns the right to have a different level of conversation. Yeah, that's a great point. And yeah, you referenced Adam uh, Houghton in the chat, brought up yeah, a couple of a, good points. And yeah. I think one of the things that he he mentioned that I think has been critical is how important uh, like executive level relationships are at the C-level. Um, your champion could love you and love your product or service, um, but you know the CFO could be putting you on like the maybe list for you know continuing to to spend money on that product. And so, um, either ensuring you have a direct relationship with you know the CFO or or some type of VP level contact, um, or have confidence that your point of contact is being transparent with you um, and has that level of transparency you know with their CFO is really important. Similar to the multi-threading topic, I think that's always easier said than done. Um, and maybe I'll tell Jay that might be a good topic for a future session to brainstorm different ways to, to number one, get multiple relationships, um, uh, or uh, number two, how to really get to the C-level um, and how to make sure that they, they appreciate and they, they recognize the value that your product is offering. Um, so uh, any minute now, we're probably going to get back into the, the Zoom uh, larger group. Um, Jay is going to pose a question to you all. Uh, what were some of your uh, like major takeaways or what was one major tactical takeaway that you had from the conversation? So feel free to prepare an answer if you have one and jump in. Um, Brian, really appreciated you sharing your deck. We're getting some asks uh, if you're willing to share it. Uh, or parts of it. Um, I appreciated how specific and tactical you were able to go with us. Definitely, I took a few notes that I'm going to take away from my org. <laughs> For that. Yeah, Thanks, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I, I have to do some, some data auditing on the slides themselves, but um, <laughs> maybe that's something I can share out uh, shortly. That would be great. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you. You knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> For that. Now we're in this weird, awkward minute where I'm like, I don't want to start a new to topic because we're probably going <laughs> to be pulled away. If the, if the slides become available, where, 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 where can they be? Like, where will they be sent? Like an email or something? I'm sure Brian can provide it to Jay. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Yeah, we're going back. Yeah. It worked. All right. <laughs> Good work. Yeah. Technology is, uh, I, if you guys, you know, I, I broke everybody out into breakout rooms and the idea was that I was going to go through each breakout room and listen in, but I got too scared. So I literally just like stood here watching the screen, like making sure nothing happened. So I was on guard the whole time. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. If awesome. it works, think, don't touch it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Uh, well, Perfect. I think we've got a couple more people filtering in, but um, excited to, to hear more feedback. Uh, we'll be sending a survey afterwards as usual. So um, excited to hear from everybody just about uh, the breakout session concept, how it worked, uh, and hopefully hear more. But uh, to end today's session, since I was not able to go through all the breakout rooms, um, we thought it'd be great to uh, just try and get back together as a larger group. And so two of the questions that I wanted to pose out to the group and anybody feel free to answer, but uh, the first question is just what was your one takeaway or one learning that you came away with from uh, the session? And then maybe the second question to answer is what is uh, maybe an immediate step or what is one action item that you feel like you're going to go implement within the next seven days? Um, so open that up to the group and see if there's anybody who'd like to share. I can kick us off. Um, we had Brian uh, LaFall in our, our group from Looker, um, and he shared um, a really tactical sort of risk assessment um, summary that he was using. And I think one of the key points he made uh, among many good ones was, um, are you able to identify uh, quantitative leading indicators to have um, your first pass at your client list, um, you know, flagging at-risk accounts based on that, um, you know, quantitative data, and then have a CSM come in and provide some qualitative feedback 
about the health of the account. Um, and so that concept in general, I think, it was a great reminder to hear that. And um, I've been taking the qualitative approach so far during this because it's, it's felt very reactive. And uh, that's one thing I'm gonna take away is overlay some quantitative leading indicators over my qualitative list and, and see if there are any discrepancies. So really appreciated Brian's share today. Awesome. Anybody else have any examples? One takeaway, one action item? Hi, this is Sharmila. I'll, I'll um, join in. Um, so first, this is my first call. So thank you so much for everyone who's um, been sharing and, and discussing um, what's been going on. I work for LexisNexis and I am a CSM. Uh, most of my clients are media clients. So I think one major takeaway is um, somebody had spoken, and my apologies for not remembering your name, is um, before sending out communication, really understanding what that company is going through so you can tailor your communication that really hits um, home and that will provide support. I think with the pandemic and everything going on, it's very important to show support and empathy and compassion, which I think this that's what we you know primarily do, but it's even more important now to show our customers that we are here to support them. So I think that's one major takeaway is really understanding and doing that research. And luckily for me, because I work for LexisNexis, I have a lot of data um, that I can search um, on companies and pretty much anything. Um, so I think that's one takeaway. And I think the, the action step is really communicating that with uh, my team and making sure that they're doing the same things um, so we can all kind of be on the same understanding and come as a united front, um, especially with what we do as, as an organization for so many organizations that are out there. So thank you so much. This has been a really great call. I really appreciate it. Awesome, I appreciate that. Uh, how about maybe Alex Farmer? I'm gonna call on, uh, call on you if you don't mind and uh, maybe give us your, your one takeaway, maybe one next step that you took away from today's conversation. I was thinking, I was, thinking, I was wondering, uh, I think alphabetically, I don't know if it puts the videos alphabetically, <laughs> but I always get picked on. Maybe it's because my, my webcam is so, sorry, it's a standing desk that I've converted in my house. I'm sorry, folks, <laughs> um, for the angle there. It's not my best. But um, so I thought it was interesting. The, uh, the big takeaway for me was, uh, I, I, again, I'm sorry, I can't remember uh, who said it, but I think it was the first speaker in our breakout session was talking about executive outreach and that being um, a key thing. Uh, for them uh, getting essentially assigning, I think it was 25 accounts to each of their uh, C-level executives and having personalized email templates reach out, basically just to kind of ask how they could help. Um, it kind of struck me, that's always been on, I think actually this person said the same thing. It's always been on your to-do list to kind of do a proper executive outreach program. And, and this definitely jumped it up that person's to-do list and, and now has done the same thing for me. So, I mean, it, I think it depends on how long this, this thing goes on and how kind of high touch or low touch, how many customers you have, right? If it can be a call or if you have to go big bang with exec outreach. But I thought that that was um, a key point in our group uh, um, to answer the question of how we're changing our approach to playbooks and if we're kind of flipping the script a little bit. Um, I thought that was key. So thanks for picking on me, Jeff. Yeah, no problem. Uh, maybe Jennifer Kirkland, you're in my... Uh, you're in my my mode of view here, uh, if you don't mind, maybe coming off mute and sharing maybe one of your takeaways uh, from the session that you sat in on. Yeah, I joined a little bit late, but as soon as I joined, it was really amazing to hear everybody say all the things that I've been kind of coming up with in my head and working to execute at, at Conversica and everything. And it was just really validating in that sense to to hear that segmentation matters in regards to who your customers are. The scores are not gonna be the same. I was in the scorecard breakout. The scores aren't gonna be the same for every customer type. Scores are gonna be different depending on where they're at in the life cycle. And your action items that you're gonna be taking are gonna be impacted by the level of maturity that the customer is at. And we were working on building this framework and I just loved hearing that other people were operating in the same methodology. Um, we're really, like driven towards having scale within our CSMs. We thought that that was critical and it was great hearing that. Awesome. How about, uh, I know, I think I've got Anna Alley maybe, um, if you don't mind sharing from your session. Yeah, so, um, so we in our business are actually working right now on crafting a health score. So the conversation in our session, I was in Jennifer's session as well, 
was super value, valuable and helpful in terms of just kind of validating that a lot of the things that we're looking at putting in and creating as part of our health score um, are the right things or at least seem to be the right things based on the conversation that we had. So that was really super encouraging. Um, and there was just, there was also some interesting conversation at the end, which is what I'm kind of taking. It's not so much a tactical takeaway as it is a philosophical takeaway to, to kind of take back to, to my leadership team to think more about. But we had some interesting conversation towards the end around health score versus customer value. And how do you think about the difference between the two? Because health score is not necessarily indicative of the value that you're delivering to the customer. Um, and so it's something that, that we've talked about internally at Avid Exchange as well. Um, but there was just some interesting conversation and some points there that, that I definitely want to be able to explore further. Awesome. Sarah Bocino, how about you? Yeah, I was, uh, we're, we're getting um, a lot of our, a lot oh, of no. from the same session. No, no worries. No, it's but fine. <laughs> I think it, it's, it's, it was really, um, again, to build off of what Jennifer said, really insightful to just kind of understand that everybody's considering um, health scores or, or launching it, but it's not the only thing that we can look at. Um, in my organization right now, one thing that I heard today was um, aligning health to the success life cycle, right? And understanding that at different stages, you know, we can at least prescribe where we can see customer health. And if we, if we judge it or if we're gauging it in those different stages, um, you know, we can perhaps put some more rigor or playbooks or programs in place to help ensure that customers don't, you know, degradate or that we're continuing to, to progress that health score. So um, that's something we're launching right now or that we're we're frameworking out right now is our success life cycle so that was really valuable um, to hear that others are are looking at that perfect what about um i think diana are you on as well i think i saw your face when i was scrolling through here do you want to share a little bit maybe yeah. what we heard yeah um so a topic that came up was around when the poc leaves and um well, it was actually a story that i shared about um, a POC leaving and the, us having to demonstrate value again because the person that came up in is now at a leadership level um, and we have to demonstrate the value again of our tool. And so um, somebody shared a story of like, um, you know, having different goals depending on where we are in, in, the, in the chain. So for example, like, you know, the, the champion would have a different goal compared to like the VP or something like that. So being able to speak to the value that you provide at each step of the way is important. So my goal now is to take this back to my team. Um, and another thing that was shared was just having a one pager of all the value that you've been providing. So documenting your value so that if something like this happens, you can quickly pull that up and uh, read that off. So that's, that's what I'm taking away. Awesome. Uh, and then I know Dave, Epperly, uh, I'm going to call on you for a minute. It looks like you had a, a good message in the chat um, just about, you know, potentially trimming some of your health score, uh, given that we're going through this time. I don't know if you're still on or not, but do you mind maybe depending on your point a little bit? Yeah. Hey guys, uh, Dave Epperly here from Red Canary. We're a cybersecurity company. We're uh, very high touch. We're also pretty nerdy. So uh, over time, these things tend to get out of hand in terms of health score, forecasting, et cetera, more data, more data, more data. We've really taken the uh, opportunity over the first uh, or last couple of weeks, rather, to just run side by side comparisons to what we're currently running in terms of health scores and forecasting with a much pared down and simplified version. It makes life, frankly, much easier for everybody. Um, and what we have found unanimously is that uh, at least the CSMs uh, kind of agree that, that, that those scores, those predictions are much more accurate from what they can predict and what they can see. So you know, we've, we've had this concept and, and implemented over time, you know, for at least the last four and a half years. And I think that what this crisis has presented us with is the opportunity to go back to basics and really get right what the fundamental pieces of that health score are. That's it. Awesome. Appreciate that. Uh, we've got about three minutes left. I know we always like to end these on time, but anybody, any final thoughts? Uh, how about Jim Jones? You got anything uh, you felt like 
you can uh, take away? Yeah, so um, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, the experience um, that some companies are having, you know, customers saying, hey, I don't have time to talk to you right now or call me in a month or whatever. Um, great indicator of, uh, of churn uh, and a great indicator of, uh, of slowing of, of potential sales. So it's good to know we're not the only ones in that boat. Um, the second thing is, is somebody said that, that they basically have stopped all new customer marketing and all the, the outreach is, is, um, go, uh, is going through the customer success teams. Um, I, I can't stand the companies that are marketing to me on LinkedIn, you know, privately or, or you know, uh, in a full message, uh, you know, across the board to everybody. Hey, we know things are, are uh, you know, bad with COVID. Let's talk about how we can help your business. And it's like, like, let's talk about how fast I can unconnect and block you on LinkedIn. You need to be genuine. You need to be authentic. You need to be there for your customers you have relationships with and say, how can I help you? Even if it's just to leave you alone for a few weeks. Yeah. Um, and, and outbound marketing um, is, is absolutely, absolutely inauthentic and tone deaf right now. Well, I know we've got about two minutes left. Um, so we'll try and, and uh, make sure we get everybody out of here on time, but I appreciate everybody coming. I think, you know, again, we, uh, we tried the breakout rooms for the first time. Hopefully uh, you heard some diverse voices uh, in the groups and that everybody got some more value in terms of having more of an intimate, smaller group. So um, as always, we'll send out a survey right after. Uh, hope to just gather some feedback, make sure, you know, again, we can keep iterating and drive value. Uh, thanks to Megan, Nils, David, and Jay for leading those sessions. Uh, really appreciate you guys uh, spending some time with us. And then um, as we mentioned, you know, we're excited about launching this uh, community in terms of uh, a platform between these sessions that we do on a weekly basis. So um, if you're interested in helping us uh, get that off the ground. You'll see a little moniker in the survey that we send out. So please indicate uh, if you'd like to help us do that. So uh, thank you again. Hope everybody has a great Thursday, a good weekend, and uh, hopefully we get to get outside and some fresh air. Thank you. Bye.